Okay, from us faculty up here at the University of Idaho, this is Karen Launchbaugh. We're going to share a little bit of information about the rangelands of the Pacific Northwest. Recall that what we're going to talk about today is part of the rangelands of North America. The Great Plains, which we talked about earlier in the class, are that whole big yellow blob in the middle of the continent. Now we're going to talk about some of these grasslands that are on the periphery, the California annual grasslands, and then what I'm just loosely calling the intermountain bunch grass type. Um, the, the, if you look more specifically at the ecoregions map uh, that, that we use in the class, remember ecoregions are things that are uh, both include climate and soils and plants, so they're this kind of conglomeration of factors. The two ecoregions we'll be looking at is Mediterranean California, and then we'll also be looking at the grassland part of the cold desert. We looked at the cold desert in the past, which was more shrublands, and now we're going to look at what the intermountain bunch grass types are, and they're part of the cold desert also. I'm going to go back to this simplified map of Kukler that is of the vegetation, rangeland vegetation types. And what we're going to look at today is this intermountain bunch grass type, which are these areas kind of right up here in the Pacific Northwest. And then we're also going to look at the California annual grasslands, which is um, on the West Coast. And I'm also at the ed on the edges of the California grasslands are um, the uh, they're oak woodlands, so we're going to look also at oak woodlands. There's also some oak woodlands in Texas that will come out of this discussion. Okay, so those are the three types we're going to look at today. Okay, of course, these are all grasslands and rangelands, mostly because they're dry. You see in the middle of California is it, that big red area. That's an area of less than 10% or 10 inches of rain a year. So oftentimes that's why we have grasslands there, because they're able to handle those really xeric communities. We're also going to look at that part of central Washington that is, is red, which is a grassland also. Let's first take a look at the Pacific Northwest climate climate. Um, it has a characteristic that it's very much like the Mediterranean and that it has um, moisture in the, the blue bars on the right hand side here. It has moisture in the spring and in the fall and all the way through the winter. The difference between the Pacific Northwest and the Mediterranean is that it's, it's just very um, mild in the winter or in the summer. So high temperatures in, in the 70s, not, not in the 90s or 100s. Every once in a while we get an extreme, but that's really unusual up in the Pacific Northwest. So wet winters and moderate summers in terms of temperature and also very dry summers. I'm just going to focus on a couple of uh, types, bunch grass types in the Pacific Northwest. First of all, our Palouse Prairie that we have here in Idaho and in Washington. The canyon grasslands that are along all the rivers uh, kind of through the intermountain area up here, the um, Pacific Northwest, uh, such as the Snake River. And uh, that this is a picture of right above Lewiston going into the Snake River. Uh, and then there's the Camas Prairie. There's several high mountain Camas Prairies in Idaho. They're just higher elevation areas that are grasslands and, and quite moist. And so this is a, a, also a, a type that is a bunch grass type within the Intermountain region. The two plants that need to think about, it's called the bunch grass type for this reason, because this, these ecosystems are all dominated by either blue bunch wheatgrass Idaho fescue and to some degree Sandberg bluegrass, but these are the two big uh, bunch grasses of this type are blue bunch wheatgrass and Idaho fescue. Again, going back to those regions, Palouse Prairie, Canyon Grasslands, Camas Prairie, some characteristics of them. Uh, the major plants, of course, are blue bunch wheatgrass, Idaho fescue. They get late summer rains and it's very un uh, uncommon to get summer rains. Um, so there, we don't have a lot of lightning strikes during the middle of the season, which might really promote grasslands. These are ecosystems that, because of their long, dry summers, it's difficult for shrubs to, to um, establish. Of course, fire would take care of the shrubs and really keep the shrubs at bay and allow the grasses to flourish. But also those long, dry summers help to um, suppress the shrubs because a shrub might start growing and then it hits July, and, and as you know, if you from living up here in Moscow, there's just very little rain that we get from about the end of June all the way through October. So if a shrub got established or a tree, it might make it to kind of a small seedling stage, and then it has to just survive that really long dry period. So two things that keep this a grassland. One is that long dry period, and then occasional fire. Not, not real frequent fire, but occasionally. And remember, these um, ecosystems are deep soils. They're, they're mollusols. 
And so um, in general, they, a lot of these, eco, these grasslands have been lost to farming, especially the Palouse. The Palouse was this really beautiful lussel, wind-blown soil. It, it is this beautiful soil. And because it was very easy to farm, um, very little of it, or less than 1% of the original prairie exists. And most of the prairie that exists, exists in rocky hillsides and, and, and such. Take a closer look at the Mediterranean now. So move south into California. It looks very much like the Pacific Northwest. It's got um, wet winters. The summers are a lot dry. Very, very little rain in July and August when you get into a true Mediterranean climate. So in the middle of the summer. And also quite a bit hotter than the Pacific Northwest. So where in the Pacific Northwest we might have had highs in the 70s and 80s. In California they can certainly be in the 90s or 100s. So very warm, dry summers and wet winters. That would be a Mediterranean climate. What we have in the uh, California grasslands is, is an annual grass. This is an annual grass that has been converted from a perennial grass. So here's an example on the left is some uh, ripcut brome. In the middle is some cheek grass. And on the right is uh, medusa head. And all those are annual, annual grasses that came from the Mediterranean region. So they were adapted to this area of California and they, and they really took over. So the key point here is that at one time there were plants like California oak grass, purple needle grass, and, and a whole host of other bunch grasses, native perennial bunch grasses. And then we had what's called in ecology a type conversion. The whole ecosystem was changed to an annual grassland. And Californians, Californian land managers, they get how to manage annual grasslands. They gave up on ever trying to go back to perennial grasslands. In Idaho, we're still on that cusp. So in much of the Great Basin, we could still maintain and keep our perennial grasses. So a lot of energy is, is, um, faced, is focused on suppressing annual grasslands and keeping the perennial grasslands. Largely in California, they are managing annual grasslands and, and they just realized that. So going back to those grasslands, some interesting things about them. They were, of course, once dominated by perennial grasslands. Uh, that warm climate, that warm, dry summers and the wet winters really was adapted to these grasses that came from ecosystems very much like California. So they came from Mediterranean regions. So the cheatgrass and medusa head are two that we are going to learn in class. Um, annual introduced grasses um, also were promoted because there was really heavy grazing early in the um, kind of in the statehood of California and because of the gold rush and then also Western development, the Oregon Trail and the California Trail. So people really want to move west, put a lot of pressure on those ecosystems. So there was probably really heavy grazing and that probably helped that quick conversion from the perennial grasslands to the annual grasslands. Um, of course, today those soils were quite good in the Central Valley of California and more than half of that region is farmed. On the edge of that annual grasslands, there's um, kind of steeper hills, more hilly country, and it is um, ringed by oak woodlands. Uh, and here you'll see s several pictures. The, the middle and the right-hand side are from California. The left-hand side is the live oak from Texas. But all of them have that savanna type characteristic, all these oak woodlands. They can be tall trees with an understory of herbaceous plants. There are several types. Uh, there's gamble oak is one that we're going to learn in class. Shinnery oak, live oak, blue oak, several oak types that occur in the oak woodlands. The, as you're growing up in elevation, you're out of the central valley, you're kind of up on those edges. So the climate is a, a little more moderate, a little cooler in the summer, certainly still very dry. Understory of grasses, it, it really can form a true savanna like some of these pictures show. And it's really important for wildlife, especially because of acorns. Oaks are really good because they produce this really high fat um, um, source, uh, which is acorns. And fire is important to maintain these systems, as is in most savannas, fire is an important uh, force. Let's uh, finish off by looking at the chaparral. The chaparral is just really a, a mix of shrubs that are, are really um, all mixed together and just cover the whole landscape. So this is a true shrub shrubland and the chaparral of California is a really good example of, of a chaparral ecosystem. There are, of course are chaparrals in other Mediterranean systems such as in uh, the Mediterranean, uh, you know, in Europe, um, in the European continent. That ecosystem also has some very important chaparral species. 
Okay, well, interesting thing about chaparral. We, we hear every summer about uh, California going up in flames, and this chaparral, that, that kind of rough shrub ecosystem is really well adapted to fire. Some people would say it's fire dependent even that we wouldn't have this shrub ecosystem. And the reason that the shrubs have an advantage in this case um, is because they have seeds uh, that last several um, years on the soil surface. And the, the, oftentimes they're waxy and they're released by the fire. And the other thing that most of these chaparral species have is they're, um, they're basal sprouters. So the, the top might burn off, but at the base, um, the, there are a bunch of uh, meristems that can be activated by fire and the plant will quickly start, um, start sending up new buds. Now, usually we think of fire coming through and grasses having an advantage because of those basal sprouts and those seeds. When a fire goes through the chaparral, the shrubs have an advantage and, and they'll come back quite quickly. So that's the chaparral. A couple points about it. There's several types of chaparral. A couple of them are the chemise red shank, the mixed and the montane chaparral, and then also the coastal scrub. Scrub is an interesting term. Usually it's a type of shrubland that is really intertwined. So when we started thinking of shrubs that are just right next to each other and intertwining uh, stems, that's often called a scrubland. There's several kinds of scrub in South America and in the Mediterranean over in the European continent. Um, today, there's about 15 million acres of, of chaparral in, in um, California. It occurs on the steeper hillsides and kind of lower montane uh, regions. Um, it's the, some of the shrubs that we'll study in class that are part of the chaparral are chemise and ceanothus. Again, this is a fire dependent ecosystem. That's just a few ecosystems from the Mediterranean and the Pacific Northwest uh, ecoregions. And they're ones that we're gonna look at in class. And so dig in and look at the plants from those regions in more detail.